uh, welcome Zoomers and YouTubers to Creative Trickery Part 2. Very good of you to join us today. I'm Paul Richards, a concept artist and art enthusiast based in Washington State in the good old US of A, broadcasting live from my non-work computer. And as you can see, uh, with my not so great webcam that'll be focusing and unfocusing for the duration for which I apologize in advance. Uh, folks, I'd like to open, if I may, with a story. Last night, I dreamt I was a rich person, uh, a one percenter rich person, and I do okay. And I was having a music room set up in the west wing of my spacious mansion. An orchestra of movers was coming in with baby grand pianos, violas, saxophones, and from outside I could hear them tuning those instruments. Not only tuning, but playing them as though it were the easiest, most natural thing in the world. Beautiful, heartfelt, extemporaneous melodies. As I listened, listened I was uh, intellectually gratified. I felt cultured, elite, an owner of fine objects of great potential. But in my heart, I was sad because I knew that there wasn't a single instrument in that room that I could play. For all my newly acquired riches, I was poor. The movers, now gone, were the musicians, and I, but a caretaker of wood, metal, and ivory. I don't have the best dreams, it has to be said, uh, but this haunting, all too relatable feeling puts the artistic struggle into a good context for today's lecture. What if art wasn't acquisition? What if it was, instead of a skill, a relationship that you built? I'm gonna pull up some slides now and run you through my personal relationship with today's topic, color. Bear with me. Yay, it's slides. I don't really like to set the slides up officially. I just kind of keep them in this format. So yeah, uh, constructive color or color for everyone abroad uh, with, with as many extra vowels uh, as you prefer. I should say that this is a talk that I could only do now at this point in my life because Prior to, oh, I don't know, five years ago, uh, I didn't have as much motivation to get involved with color. In fact, uh, you could actually say that I had an adversarial relationship with it. My 20s and 30s were concerned mostly with line and shape, as some of you might know, uh, and that remains my favorite means of expression. Looking at the artwork I've presented over the years, you might actually think that I'm the last person who should be talking, uh, you should be taking color advice from. But I assure you, given my current disposition and uh, almost 42 year old inclinations, it's a subject that I've given very much attention to recently. I'm not an authority on it. Uh, I just have an increased familiarity with it. Uh, the relationship got enriched. Lines and shapes now ride in the back of the car next to perspective and proportion, and it's colors time. Now, the kind of relationship that I'm talking about with color is that of a child. At some point, uh, I feel like I lost touch with this kind of early acquaintance with color that we all have when we're using crayons in preschool, through our formative years playing with Lego. Now think about exactly what Lego blocks are and what they do and how each individual block can mean different things. Uh, green, say, can be the canopy of a tree. Red might be the perfect building block for a fire hydrant or fire engine. You know, orange could be, uh, well, I don't know, uh, the sun or, um, oh, I don't know, a tabby cat. But yeah, uh, let me explain how this shift occurred, this, this priming that I've had for color. It began uh, with my wife, actually, Lena Richards, who some of you may know online or uh, through uh, her work recently on Magic the Gathering. 
she basically uh, kind of brought color into my life and taught me about something really important, uh, which was the principle of uh, warm within cool and cool within warm. And this became uh, something really kind of interesting. You can see here, uh, this robed figure, this red robed figure is warmth uh, amid a, a largely cool forest. Here, uh, she's drawn a Kitsune character who has uh, blue tassels in the midst of, of a warm region. It's cool within warm, warm within cool. Here, a cool face within a warm cowl. This is something that I've seen now uh, cropping up in, in numerous examples. These are examples from uh, Ori and the Will of the Wisps. Here we have a, a warm within cool composition, and here we have a cool within warm composition, the little figure here. Some examples from uh, the animated film Klaus, which is topical for the upcoming Christmas season. You can see uh, the warm within cool, the cool within warm. And then two examples that I uh, pulled up, one from Sidney Gregg and one from James Zapata. Both of these are warm within cool. You have the warm figure and lights in the snowy cool backdrop. Here you have the warm nose and ears sitting inside a mostly cool backdrop. So Lena uh, was the one that kind of turned me on to this. So yeah, first simple key to color, uh, marry well, I would say. The, the second cipher that I had along this, uh, this journey was brought to me by my friend, Kaylin Chalk, whom some of you will know, who introduced me to uh, lab color and the concept of rolling warm and rolling cool. Um, you could say that these were color training wheels. I, I don't think a month has passed at this point without me thanking him for this. And I'll soon be demonstrating exactly what I mean very soon. Uh, the third cipher was something I, I really couldn't have predicted and unfortunately can't talk much about uh, the game I've been on for the past three years has required a far more robust use of color than any other projects I've worked on to date. And I should preface that none of what I'm about to get into is at all related to my employer and is my personal approach to color. I just wanted to give that crew due credit for my development along these lines. So props to them. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the tyranny of drawings. Um, as you know, since I'm a big line and shape kind of guy, there is, uh, it should be pointed out that drawings are usually kind of lousy indicators of how complete something is or isn't. Uh, black and white drawings can be really beautiful in their own right and appear to function well enough in their own medium. But I've, I've come to understand as a designer that you really don't know what you have until you see it in color. Um, I, I've come to think that a drawing kind of locks you in a little bit and lines can get in the way of having fun with color in that way that I described earlier. Um, they can cage the imagination in a way. And uh, of course, I'm a huge proponent of line. Uh, I can recall a notable concept artist years ago advising a student to abandon line and I've been cursing their name ever since. I can verify that uh, working with line and color simultaneously is frustrating because um, the line affects the color and vice versa. Um, so it's like I wanted to lift that process out. The first uh, example that I ever saw of someone doing this was Arnold Sang. The, uh, the, the, the visual mastermind behind the game Overwatch. And I saw Arnold coming up with uh, these little color rough indications that he made prior to doing the line art for his finished character designs. Uh, these were very kind of like scribbly and loose. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. It seemed like that was just him kind of like creating a, um, a signpost for himself, a, a, a notation for what he wanted the final impression of the design to be. Uh, then of course, there were the works of Corey Loftus and Garrett Hanna, who kind of introduced this idea of draw painting, that they were, uh, they were approaching uh, art generation non-linearly. In the words of Garrett Hanna, uh, anything can go at any time. And I found that 
idea really liberating. And, and as I look um, at these examples here, you know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing color used in a very constructive sense. You know, the, the red of uh, Baby Yoda's little hat here, you know, uh, against the white, you know, very classic Christmas, you know, and that's all set against the snow and these little, you know, red uh, blossoms coming up inside. Like, I think we've all seen these kind of things in winter scenes. Um, and then you have uh, the, little, the little cup uh, the little warm within cool green, you know, popping out. Uh, so, so very inspiring examples. I wanted to give you an example of what I was talking about uh, when I was talking about the tyranny of drawings. Now, here's two little sketches that I kind of barfed out to kind of show you how um, when, you, when you are just dealing with something in a drawing, it's hard to know what you've actually got. And I, I splashed some color on these as best I could and I was like, darn it, there, there, just isn't, um, there just isn't a lot going on in these things. Color-wise, they still seem kind of mm, not quite there. There's some kind of, you know, there's a nice base tone and a secondary. And here, you know, we have the open eyes and a little bit of blue inside like the, the, the largely warm area, but uh, just not as much to work with. The drawing didn't give us an indication uh, of all the things as they might exist in color. But going in on a layer above everything, freeing myself from the quote unquote tyranny of drawing, I found that I was able to kind of flesh out these designs a little bit more, albeit abstractly. You can see that I've kind of teased a tongue out of each of their mouths, which kind of puts uh, another color note. I've, um, as I can toggle back and forth between uh, I've introduced uh, colors in the eyes here. I've brought in teeth, uh, these fins, and then a bunch of these sort of abstract glowing triangular sigils and tattoos. Oh, and, and you know, yeah, this, this fin here with the light kind of sort of shining through. Now, you know, I, I just think it's an interesting way to evolve a design. And I would actually rather preach uh, not starting from a drawing, but starting right from the color itself directly, which is what today's talk is going to be centered largely about. And uh, since our last little thing was, I, I'd, I'd call it um, info heavy demo light, what I wanted to do today was do something that was demo heavy info light and just kind of touch upon a few little um, notes and tricks uh, that I've come to use in my more recent exploration of color. So uh, I will switch over to Photoshop and introduce a little exercise that you yourself can do if you're out there in uh, TV land with your, um, your tablet and uh, drawing app of choice. I'll be using Photoshop, but you know, I would imagine this can be done even in Microsoft Paint if you want. Oh, look, there she is again. The exercise that I want to run you through, and those of you who have uh, taken uh, my class at the Workshop Academy a year ago now might remember me bringing up this, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And what I'm going to try to do here today is I'm going to try to develop three characters in color simultaneously to give myself an opportunity to explain some of these points and also to serve as comparison points. Because I always think it's, it's easier to design something in, uh, you know, with, with friends around than to design things in isolation, don't you? Here, um, I'll, I'll bring up the whole lab color thing again. This isn't going to be a technical demonstration about how to use Photoshop. I think enough of that stuff is floating out there. But most of you who use Photoshop will probably be more familiar with the HSB color pick. It's the, it's the default. Uh, so you can see here, and I'll skip to a, a brush that I prefer. And again, brushes don't matter. Use whatever you want. I'm using a square brush. So you can see that in HSB, we're not given a lot of, we're given more desaturated versions of the color and more saturated versions of the color, darker saturation versions of the color, 
darker desaturated versions of the color. Uh, and so if you color pick using this method, it doesn't give you a lot of options. You'll, you're going to wind up kind of in monochrome land. So switching over to lab color, you can do so by selecting the little A in lab here. Thanks again, Kaylin Chalk, for bringing this into my life. You can see how the landscape changes. I can select this color here, and you'll see if I roll to my left, the color gets more cool. And if I roll to my right, the color gets more warm, with ultimate warmth here. And of course, you can also kind of roll warmer here and cooler there. But what I think is neat about this is that it kind of operates, like I said, as, as color training wheels. And it's just a very friendly um, way to get new colors on the palette, because there they are sort of in front of you right away. So, so for the good and the bad and the ugly, I want to do three characters. One of them is going to be what I think about as good, like positive influence character. One's going to be bad, something I think about as kind of like a, a negative or evil character. And the last one is going to be ugly. And by ugly, I mean, we're going to try to do on this example in color, the most outrageous, discordant, unpleasant scheme that we can generate. And we'll come back to that often throughout the course of this thing. And it's my hope that by doing weird things with color, ghastly experiments, that it's going to give us ideas for things to do with the rest of that. Now, if I pull out just this chunk here with this spot of green, it already kind of gives me something that's kind of compatible with my good here. Let's, um, let's for the sake of clarity, go ahead and label these. So when you're a child, you're not really intellectualizing these decisions very much. And you're just kind of letting things happen. So I hope um, as I'm going along that you'll also try out this experiment just to kind of be in the spirit of the exercise. Mostly when we think about um, bad things, a lot of kind of dark imagery kind of comes to mind, right? Oh, and, and by the way, we can switch over to our values by hitting control Y. I've got that set up already. Uh, shout out to Tom Skulls for teaching me how that worked many years ago now. I have no concrete plan in mind. You'll see sometimes I'll, I'll use uh, the little color sliders as well. Uh, oftentimes when you use lab, see how the saturation shoots way up? I like to temper that somewhat with the with the color bar, just, uh, just so that I don't get crazy into saturation land all the time. There's um, Todd Harris, a coworker of mine that said, with great saturation comes great responsibility. Of course, um, referencing Stan Lee and Spider-Man is basically his way of saying that unless something's really, really important, it might not be deserving of such saturation. So I'm getting kind of like an angelic quality from good. I could just go all out 
and create uh, something really, you know, when I, when I think of an angelic presence, I think of halos and halation. Something I like to do just to get extra colors on the palette is switch over to hard light. Put on a little bit. What I think is interesting about color, and I have a, a visual for this, is that when you're drawing with a pencil, you only have this one solo mark. But I always feel like when you're working in color, the thing that makes it look vibrant and enriched isn't the color and its naked aspect, but the color alongside other colors. So it's almost as though we need to learn how to draw with a pencil that has three tips or more, you know? So every move you make in color has to be followed up by other moves that are compatible. Again, we're not concerning ourselves with the literal here. We're, we're dealing with just color as pure abstraction. I might want to indicate, I'm probably gonna do some kind of demonic thing here. Since we talked about warm within cool and cool within warm, I see this as an opportunity to maybe make this guy um, kind of like a cool skinned demon of sorts. Oops, I'm still on my hard light layer. Again, that, that stacking that you get just by kind of putting on different colors creates this kind of vibration that's nice. So it, it just feels good on your eyeballs in the same way that I suppose, uh, you know, drawing with crayons when you're a kid or, or finger paint or something, it just feels good to get that kind of feedback between you and what you're doing. And whenever I'm stumped, I'm just going to go back over and add some something new and ugly onto ugly. We're going to just make this a hot mess. And we'll see where this is going to go after a while. I'm going to go on to a layer called difference. This is a trick that uh, Lena taught me. So difference, oh, that's ghastly. Oh, that's such garbage, such beautiful garbage. Difference, if you adjust the fill, starts to do different things, different horrible, horrible things. What happens if we get a difference layer on top of a difference layer? Ooh, horrible wounds begin to appear. Suddenly this is a, this is some kind of being from another dimension, some kind of Lovecraftian color out of space kind of thing. What ideas can we pull from here? I kind of like these little, they look like, yeah, like festering wounds. I wonder if that's something that we could introduce to um, this guy over here. Maybe? Maybe not. said we were going to make him a demon, so let's just do that. Again, it's like, I'm sure a lot of you will find, at least those of you that weren't weaned on digital tools, that when you switch to digital, you lose something of your shapey elegance, right? You start to become, uh, there's something about digital that makes you want to be more wibbly, more um, smooth and wobbly. Some of these uh, tools even have stabilizers and stuff that are, will make your, your strokes super round and smooth and mushy. Here with these horns, I'm gonna roll cool to get kind of like a highlight color. The sky is cool, so I'm just gonna pepper that in. Maybe make it even shinier by going further up. I'm not gonna add it everywhere. I'm going to create kind of a, a gradient, a progression of, of lightness here, because it doesn't need to, if I make it down the whole thing, it loses a little bit of its oomph. I like to kind of um, lead up to that. 
and this isn't really a talk on you know rendering or presentation, but I'll bet if we went to the edge of this and just put a little kind of like happy Bob Rossi sort of rim light on there, that that would be kind of like, it would sparkle against the eye. And, you, and I did that by rolling cool. So even though I don't really like what the little red sorers were doing um, on top of this guy, this does give me the idea that this guy could be partially on fire. You know, he's, we've got the cool within warm, but I could see using this to give him some fiery eyes, right? The color's on the menu now, so I can use it. It's like having a little throwaway palette. How's that looking? Okay. Bad's looking pretty bad. Good's still looking pretty good. Let's let's add um, maybe with a lighten layer, let's add some. Maybe not with that, maybe with like a green. Hard light, maybe. Hard light likes saturated stuff. Doesn't work well with unsaturated stuff. Do we like that? We like that halation. We can leave it there for now. This is a this is a fictional being. These are all fictional beings. I'm kind of not liking that the horns that are kind of really purple and the pants are also really purple. I like to do something just kind of different with the lower portion. The skin tone seems to be like it's like this blue, right? This blue purple. So let's like use that to construct his arms with. You can see that's very, very push saturation wise. I might want to bring that down a little bit. Because, um, you know, you can't have every single color on these things scream at you. You know, I really want the, the eyes to remain kind of like the climactic element of the thing. Sculpting and modeling can always happen later. But this isn't about being professional. This is just about having fun. Do you remember fun, everybody? Do you remember when art used to be fun? I do. Back before it was a business, back before you had to market yourself and, oh God. So many responsibilities. This is kind of a mistake, these little these little arm bracelet things I'm putting on them. I don't really like that pink because I really think it could be more of like a strap. But I can just dust that on while I'm waiting to do other things. Let's maybe try getting some of the rest of them involved there. And this is super jank, so you know you don't have to worry about like layer cleanliness. Because again, cleanliness, when you're a kid, you're not concerned about cleanliness. It's the last thing you're concerned about. You just want your just want to do your art, you just want to do your thing. So who cares if the layer stack gets gets all crazy? If the um, if his horn color is this kind of dark purple, that makes me think that his claw color might also be. So I can go indicate that real quick. Every once in a while, my my chosen color will go to the back of my thing. <laughs> it's just like, it's a Photoshop quirk. Direct all complaints to Adobe. See, I'm kind of focusing on, on too much uh, one of these things. So every single time I, I can feel myself doing that, I want to add some more to the rest. And when I had, don't have an idea, I'm going to make, I'm going to make ugly even uglier. I'm going to experiment with strange layer modes. Here's vivid light. Oh my God. Now there's like, there's something appearing in the mist, right? Look at this hot trash, this hot saturated trash. Even so, let's go to something weird like exclusion. Oh, jeez. 
wasn't expecting this. How ghastly. Now it kind of looks like they have a head that's kind of covered in gelatin. See, it's kind of, it's doing things with my imagination that I wasn't really expecting. I, I almost see this like a jellyfish head now, which makes me think that he could have little jellyfish tendrils down here. That's ugly, right? Actually, I think jellyfish are beautiful. Let's not jellyfish shame. By the way, you'll, you'll notice that I'm working on a, a neutral gray backdrop. That's because um, white is such a high powered color. White, if, uh, if a color could make a noise would be, ah! It's just way too loud and it's hard for other things to um, have full power next to white. Absolute black you can get away with because it's it's quieter. But white, you have nowhere to go. Now let's see if let's see if um, this new design gives us. Here, let's go to soft light and let's push a really kind of like hard light maybe. Push a weird. Now I know what you guys are thinking that this. I'm not trying to create what you think I might be trying to create here. So just to, just to clarify here. here, let's put a little hat on him instead. This is, the, this is a drawing of an adult. He's, he's proper, so he carries a cane. Maybe he carries several canes. He's so ugly. This, by the way, will tell you what your D and D alignment is. The more you focus on one character versus the other, I seem to be seem to be more evil, don't I? I haven't really done much over here at all, have I? Well, let's let's not let's not neglect good. Maybe we can pull out a little chunk here. Invert it. Does that do anything? Well, that's interesting. Gives us a little bit of uh, pink there. We get, put that on lighten. Huh, interesting. Get a little, get a little chunk. Now we're getting experimental with our digital. I like that little bit of pink there. This is this is a celestial being. Let's um, let's make them. Let's make this a little bit more human. Let's give them some skin. This is almost kind of starting to look like a wing to me. So I'm just gonna, it's very, very tropey, right? You know, I'm not gonna get too many originality points for this, but let's just say, yeah, good as an angel. We've got our, our warm within cool. Maybe we wanna even try tinting this halo so that that warm can really uh, ring out, maybe. We can donut now. This green is interesting to me. Green is, of course, evocative of things like you know leaves. So, I like the idea that there uh, she might be holding some kind of um, laurel wreath, right? Plants always seem good. Maybe she has some actual hair, some darker hair that we could pull from elsewhere in the design or not. 
Let's see. I'll choose a brown maybe. Brown means hair. Let's see now, we have most of the focus is up here. Wings are a little on the light side, so I'm gonna darken them a little bit. Don't need to be value Nazis here, but you know, it helps. Of course, all, all talks about color will tell you that all color problems are value problems and they're not wrong, but when you're five, I don't think you think about that too much. Let's give him a cool weapon. I like the flaming fire eye. And I like this, so I'm gonna just go ahead and Orange means fire. We're creating, again, a progression. We don't want to put it everywhere. We can keep going up through our lab color and get something really creamy. It doesn't behave like real fire physics. Make it go like that. Let's take a red, maybe this red. And, you know, of course, where there's um, fire, there's smoke, and vice versa. Maybe little embers flying off. That's always fun. These little things mean ember. Even in the ember, it's like, it's not just one color, it's several. It's still kind of looking boring. I wonder if we could take some of the good, bring it into here, give them some kind of cool wicked pendant. Grr. Go to maybe darken, darken it down here and there. It's got a nose, maybe too strong for a nose. Let's work on our eyes a little bit. We've already got a dark, dark on the palette, which is pretty good for doing punchy, contrasty, dark eyes. Then we'll, 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 we'll actually use white for our eye lights, even though most people will tell you that eyes aren't pure white, but whatever. Maybe we can get an idea from Ugly over here about what color her eyes should be. Kind of green, maybe? Take a little red here from, from Demon Man to make her little lips. So let's liven up that hair a little bit, you know, put some. Let's go back to Ugly over here. Do some more ugly things. Ooh. Ugly's had an accident. Ugly's been shot several times. Here and here. Poor guy. 
and he's slowly bleeding. To now that kind of looks like a face. Maybe there's a person imprisoned inside of him. Now there's several. You get the idea. Ugly is an eater of souls. Adorable eater of souls. Let's see. If it's just if a skin is just that one uniform color, it looks like it grades kind of lighter at the bottom. So let's get that represented there. Let's give him a tail for crying out loud. Maybe he deserves a magical jewel. The magical jewel rolls cool. Because you have to be able to see it, right? Now you can definitely see it. Before, yeah, it kind of blends in. Maybe. Different colors mixed in there. Let's get like a greener green in there. Stack it up. Maybe the center of it glows. To see that these bandages here get a stronger uh, bandage identity. Right now, they're too close to the color of his kind of underbelly there. Some nostrils. Not really feeling that jewel color now. Kind of wish it was something else. I just Change it to red. I feel like that works better. Kind of jives with his kind of red thing he's got going there. Maybe we give her some, um, since her design is pretty white, it kind of makes a nicer progression if we can do something down here that's a little darker. Maybe, um, maybe there's something else actually uh, in, her, in her kit. Maybe she's got Darker arms. Just using stuff that's already kicking around. We'll roll cool. Just to kind of liven it up. Blue, I think. Um, or it has been pointed out to me by my friend Elliot Min, freshens an image. I like, I like the sound of that. Let's give him some ears. And since we like our subsurface scattering, let's make them partially transparent. With some little light coming through in the back. And since we've done that, and it kind of overpowers the eyes a little bit. Let's go max trajectory and really pump these things up to super, super obnoxious brightness levels. There we go. We can even uh, reduce this just a tad. Careful, getting into ugly territory. You know, um, I almost think that this thing here could be a blade, right? Get a blade involved. 
bladed weapon. That's cool though, right? We'll take a color that we already have, desaturate it, roll it cool. Now that's kind of like a sword. Down and cool, indicate the bottom of the blade. We're gonna find back some of the kind of like flame kind of stuff. There we go. Bleah. Again, this is just kind of like, how does it feel on the palette? So I've got 10 minutes remaining. I'll have things that I'll point out during the, the Q&A, but um, I, I'm gonna keep going here for like another few minutes just so that you can totally get the point of what I'm trying to do. I'm gonna give her some gloves, maybe. No, I'm gonna give her actual her actual hand here, clutching the thing. And I'll put her other hand down here. As we have the skin already kind of established. A little feather falling off. I'm gonna reduce this in size, not that proportion really matters. So I'll explain to you why later. Yeah, it's important that ugly is good and ugly. See, see how ugly you can make something. Put it to yourself as a challenge. Just kind of goof around with it. Just use a random ass color. Just blob it down. You know, you're not really um, you're not really wasting paint. To me, it seems like you know one of the best things about digital art is this idea that we're not really uh, parting with all this kind of expensive physical stuff. Look how ugly, this is so successful. I'm so pleased with how this is coming out. Occasionally invert. He lives underwater, so he's got little bubbles. His horns are a little bit too saturated. We're gonna, in the, in the last, we're gonna go on a saturation hunt. We're gonna take a few things that are too saturated and decrease the saturation just because it's a good idea. We're gonna take other things that are a little bit too bright. Reduce saturation, reduce brightness, just to see what it does. He deserves, uh, I think, better, cooler horns, right? Grr, spikes. The concept art's bread and butter if you live in 2006. Maybe we could tinge the horns with just a little bit of that kind of crackly fire. Maybe that would be cool. Like they were, they're still burning from the inside. That's a fun thing to do with color. We'll take some sample from uh, our guy over here. Maybe you could set this to lighten. Yeah, there we go. Ooh, smoldering, broken off horns. Cool. Still not quite liking what's going on here with the wraps. Wish they were a little bit different color, but we only have so much time. What do they read like um, you, you control Y? Yeah, it's still a little bit too, uh, too dark. We got this color here that looks like it's for metal. Maybe we could hang a dagger or something off of him. Some other little implement. Take that same metal and put it down here. Hmm? It's there. It's there for us to use. It's on the palette. Let's put something kind of weird and embryonic down here. 
something kind of, oh, I don't know, like a little egg. Ooh, it says belly button. Let's, let's color dodge that up. Light. Little god rays from the belly button. Why not? It's ugly and it doesn't matter. Glow, because glowy is good. Leaves are a little bit light in value. Let's just darken them just a tad and we'll be done. Does that read? Yeah, that's a little bit better. Few more spikes. Maybe just a, I'm, I'm spike happy. I, I need my spikes. There, spikes. Ta da! Look what a beautiful thing we've made. Look how color was used to construct ideas. Here's a little fabric tie that seems nice. Maybe she's got a little bit of gold jewelry somewhere. We're going to just keep this up during the Q&A section. We're going to keep adding to it because an important part of this process is stepping away from it and seeing how you feel about it later. I'm going to keep sharing my screen, but um, Let's see about the time here. Yeah, we're running right up until four. Um, my, my closing thoughts here are that just as a sense of perspective and proportion trumps grids and measurement, a sense of color trumps color theory. And how do you get a sense for things or anyone for that matter? Well, you spend time with them. You build a relationship, preferably a playful, unexpected relationship, one where both parties get something out of it. Because, you know, uh, calculating photon trajectory and getting super anal about optics, uh, in my opinion, is a recipe for boredom and breakup. You don't consult a chart when you art. Color wants its own things. It's like a person wants its own things and you have to listen and respond to what's being done. At the end of my last talk, I quoted the jazz musician, Miles Davis, to sum up my feelings about image composition. The music world, I feel, has a lot to teach us, visual artists, uh, about our craft. And I imagine that goes both ways. Musicians play by ear, we play by eye. We feel, we riff, it is our ongoing dialogue, it is our song. Uh, I, I hope that I've emboldened you by this slipshod example uh, to take the next step in a more personal, casual, constructive relationship with color. And I'll see you again in part three. Just remember anything that you can trick yourself into doing uh, or enjoying, you can trick yourself into doing well. So uh, with, with that, Josh, I'll let you dip in and conduct the Q&A portion of the end. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for doing the workshop. Paul, if you do want to stick around for a Q&A for maybe like 10, 15 minutes, it's up to you. You don't yeah, have to. As long as you want to go, really. I'll just kind of keep petting. I've got other slides and things that might organically come up as a result of this kind of okay. talk. But 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 yeah, uh, let's just uh, let's take like three, four questions. Is that good? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I, I, I don't uh, I, I wouldn't object to more, but we'll we'll, we'll see how it goes. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so put it in the chat if you have any questions and we'll, I'll, I'll relay it to Paul. Yeah, thanks guys. Thanks for uh, being present and, and paying attention to this. I hope this, this, this probably comes off like the ramblings of a madman, but um, I, you know, for me, it's been very therapeutic.
Uh, right, give us a minute to see if people ask questions. Okay, so Anton said, hey, Paul, in part one, you say that you hate refs. Can I ask you how you use them? When <laughs> uh, hate is such a strong word. And I did say that, didn't I? I did, I, I did say the word hate. Uh, for the purpose of this demonstration, um, I don't know that I have used reference when I was a little kid. I was just kind of going off whatever I thought was cool and my synthesis of things that I saw and experienced. I think the first thing I ever drew was like an R2-D2. So uh, my approach to reference is very, very much kind of like do it in study form, get it under your fingernails, try to synthesize it, get an opinion about it, and then if it manifests in the work later on, so be it. Cool. So I think we'll take two more questions. Uh, wait a minute. If there's no questions, then we can end it. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I can just talk about other stuff too that's, that's related to this, uh, this, this so practice. Benjamin asks, when working for art directors, how much do they allow you to do your own thing? And how much do they restrict you to just draw what they want to see? Oh my gosh, you're trying to get me in trouble. Uh, I, I may have to decline answering that question, <laughs> but, but, but it, it goes without saying that everybody, um, everybody has their own touch points with reality. Everybody has things that they want to see in art. Um, so it's uh, one thing I have noticed is that people tend to like things if they can see at least 30% of themselves in them. So your job as uh, the employee is trying to get at what your art director is really into and um, let them lead to the point where they can see enough of themselves in it to like the thing that you're doing. Um, you gotta let them in, uh, collaborate. Um, I don't wanna say cater, but it just, it helps to know your audience. So you don't want to, uh, you know, if the person that you're working for is geared a certain way, you don't want to show them something that's completely not in their like creative wheelhouse, right? It's also dependent on the problem you're solving. Like um, sometimes they'll be looking at certain key ref and if they share that with you, then you're on the same page and that allows you to deliver what they expect more. Uh, if, if you're operating blind, that's really hard. So develop good relationships is the, um, uh, the mantra of this particular talk, I would say. Good relationships with people, good relationships with your process. Okay, uh, BKARR2 asks, should you contrast warms and cools for the sake of contrasting warms and cools? Example, just for appeals? Or is there a methodology you use to contrast warms and cools? Well, I, I often think that there's there's a time for doing that, right? Like there's um, uh, like it, it just kind of looks good when, when you've gone warm for a long period to go cool at like an edge or something. Like it just kind of it just feels right. Um, and similarly, uh, you you can grade things more warm. Like I can I can take this little underbelly patch and roll it a little lighter and a little warmer. And I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that kind of creates an interesting kind of like shift. Like you're trying to create little, little color progressions, little gradients, essentially. Um, you, when and where you use them, it, whether that's trying to kind of create, like here I've created warmth within cool, um, the, the, the cool angelic body, and then the kind of like warm skin tones. You know, here, here again, it's like kind of warm within cool. You, you find a bias, but there's places to flip that all over the place. And, and you can experiment, you know, whatever you want um, and kind of play, play by ear and let your eyes react to what you're doing. Your eyes are the best barometer of how successful something is. So you might, with adjustment layers, make wild moves, you know, like go somewhere completely unexpected because you thought like, wow, this is, this is skewing too warm and I want to temper that. And what is it, what is it like if I do that? What is it like if I make this super bright, you know? Um, 
and you can always get it back. That's another thing that is important to remember. You can always, you know, when it, once you've set up that kind of like, oh, there's cools on this side or whatever, regardless of what you do, you can always reinstate them. You don't have to feel bound to what you're doing. See, this right here makes me think like, well, gosh, I could have, I could have reddened the trim. You know, I could, I could make the garment kind of like this with like kind of a, a V-neck thing or, or play with like a fire pattern. Uh, you know, does, does that look good? Does that send too much attention down beneath? You know, I kind of think it does. I kind of think it makes it a little too busy. Cool. And um, I think Anton had another color uh, question. How do you feel about studying color from still life? You mean just from, uh, from, from fruit and stuff laying around? Yeah, or like if you look out your window, do like a painting. I don't know if you ever do that. Oh, the the the, the plain air camp. Yeah, the plain air camp does some really interesting stuff. Uh, I I often feel like um, plain air is for people who really are in love with landscape, like barns and trees and mountains and stuff. Um, I'm more interested in people and faces and organisms. So that has never really appealed to me. I. If you're, if you're looking to me for kind of an academic uh, strategy in terms of how to get good with, um, you know, focusing on various targeted things like, you know, value and uh, color or whatever, the, the, the way that you would read, you know, James Gurney, uh, th that's not really what I'm all about. I may be in later years once I warm up to it. But um, I, I, I rather think that, you know, you can become your own dictator of taste. Maybe that'll be a topic for a new talk. How, I, how Paul Richards warmed up to reference. How I learned to stop hating and love the bomb. I'll tell you something else though. I'll tell you about a term this is more in keeping with um, this talk that I'm giving. It was a term, someone turned me on to a guy at, uh, at work named Jack Bohm brought to my attention this concept here from a book that I actually already own called The Universal Princi Principles of Design. It was something called Propositional Density, which uh, you can see the definition here, which is just pasted into Google, but it's basically a fancy term for meaning, how rich a thing is in meaning. Like I, I like to use the example of uh, this artist here, Zio Arts, as somebody who, you know, if you combine this pink with these greens, as in this reference here, Zio Arts is a person that doesn't shy away from reference, uh, you're gonna get watermelon. That's gonna read as watermelon to a lot of people. You know, here it's like golf ball, here it's tennis ball and on and on and on. This is an artist that I think is really brilliant uh, and doing some real fun stuff. You can find their stuff on Twitter, I believe, and probably Instagram. But um, what, I, what I think is interesting about working this way is that you, even if, you, if what you're doing is clunky looking as a color rough, you can then take that idea and then do a drawing after the fact. It's like reversing the poles, right? color becomes the alpha and the omega. It's at the beginning and the end of your artistic pipeline, uh, informing you from the get-go. Because without color, who knows, maybe I wouldn't have wound up with this exposed brain pan. Maybe I wouldn't have given him a scarf. Maybe I wouldn't have put a television screen in his chest with a gl glowing cat. Um, these are all ideas that were given to me strictly from color, um, conceptualized using Colors constructive capacity. Uh, there's a question from YouTube from Andy C. Uh, you mentioned earlier that digital tools often push you towards creating unappealing wobbly shapes. Is there a thought process or method you use to prevent this? And this should be the last question since I don't want to take up your time. Oh yeah, it's it's, it's quite all right. But yeah, we can we can cap it there. Uh, it's a good question. Um, 
I, I, uh, I'm no newcomer to digital. I've been using digital tools now for upwards of 20 years, uh, but I was weaned on traditional. Like I still like to draw uh, on paper, usually cheap copy paper that I don't have any fear of wasting. And um, what I notice about uh, paper and pencil is that you can really turn on a dime. That, that graphite tip on the wood pulp grips and there's a tooth to the page and you can kind of like dig in and pivot. So in terms of kind of being aware of that kind of skating quality of, uh, of the stylus on the tablet surface, I haven't come up with a neat workaround, but um, I will say uh, I was introduced to a dual brush by a buddy of mine, Glenn Israel at B43. It's been years now since I've seen or talked to him. But he has this brush that he showed me that's basically like two inputs instead of one. And when you shrink that down, there's something about the feel of this particular brush that feels like it grips the canvas more. I feel like when I'm working with a brush that has this reiki quality, that I go slower and that I, the way that it stacks upon itself, it feels like I can turn on a dime. And this is now, you know, it's just, it's a question of what you find out there, because brushes aren't magical. It's a very common question during any kind of artistic demonstration. It's like, oh, are you using Procreate? Are you using Clip? Are you using Photoshop? What brushes do you use? Can I use your brushes? Um, and, and, and oftentimes it doesn't matter, but you know, sometimes it does. Sometimes it's like with, with this here brush that I'm using right now, I really get that kind of hatchy, rakey quality that I like. Also, uh, working in a lower resolution, not working on a 600 DPI image that's you know over 9,000 pixels wide uh, will help you, I guess, um, make kind of like tighter, grippier decisions. The whole conundrum is that when you're working on paper, you're you're, you're making decisions almost like a god. You're uh, you can get an insane amount of resolution and detail in a tiny little area. Whereas to get that same amount of resolution in a digital drawing, you know, you need to kind of zoom up on it. And um, that's where you get your precision back. So I imagine that as, as, the, as the tools improve, as the years wear on, you're going to see that, that dissonance become uh, less and less. So uh, it's, I don't think it's a thing to be worried about, but um, you know, if, 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 you're, if you're worried about kind of your shapes coming out wobbly or whatever, you can always do your, your crappy pass that's like super, super wobbly and super ugly, um, you know, decrease it in opacity and then, you know, ch chisel the shapes out, do like another kind of like, okay, I, this is wobbly, I wanted more of an angle and get that back on the second pass. A lot of my favorite artists out there use an, an almost like three pass kind of method. Um, they don't, they're not necessarily direct. They're not necessarily, you know, uh, human printers. And I, and I think uh, that just, you know, via experimentation and being patient with yourself, you can, you can get those shapes that you want. If that's an okay answer to your question, I hope I've answered it. I want to thank uh, Josh Cow at the Workshop Academy for whipping this broadcast together. Josh gave me an opportunity to teach at the Workshop Academy back when it was a brick and mortar school out in Redmond, Washington. And today is kind of a momentous day because a lot of, um, a lot of that stuff is being packed up. Uh, the physical location, as I understand, has become a bit of a COVID-19 casualty, which is kind of a, uh, just unsettling. But um, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> basically moving everything online. So the whole school is moving online. We've been doing that for like the last uh, three terms now anyway. Yeah, you, you guys can all go to the workshopacademy.net for details on current and future learning opportunities, uh, wherever you are on the planet. Uh, also, you can reach out to me personally. I'm on Facebook and I'm on ArtStation, not on Instagram, uh, but I always welcome a little chat. You can tell me how ridiculous this was. Uh, or you can reach out and just, um, talk art. I just like that. Uh, thanks again for, for coming and, and listening to me prattle. 
And uh, thanks to all my friends at the Workshop Academy that I've met through the years. It's been a pleasure getting to know you and I, I consider all of you my good friends.